And we'll go to the webpage in a minute, but for now, uh, I'll just show it to you. If you don't have it yet, it's called A Course in Phonetics by Peter Latifoged and revised by Keith Johnson. Peter Latifoged was certainly one of the greatest phoneticians who ever lived. And he was not only that, he was probably one of the very greatest teachers of phonetics who ever lived. He died in 2006. He came to Taiwan at least once, probably more times. I saw him once in Taiwan. And when you use the book, you will find out why we're so crazy about it. I mean, how many people really love a textbook? But in this class, and we've taught it for over 10 years now, the students end up really liking this textbook and also the other one that we'll use second semester if you're back. So Peter Latifoged is really the master as far as I'm concerned. This is, as far as I've heard, is the best-selling linguistic text in the States. The best-selling. However, in the U.S., it cost over a hundred U.S. dollars. You paid only about four ninety. Is that right, Taiwan dollars? Well, why is it so expensive? It doesn't look like it should be so expensive, right? Can you figure out why they make it so expensive? It's a sure thing. It's so popular they can get a lot of money from it, so they do. Other books don't make a lot of money, so they make up for it with this book. And what's happened is, because of this, some teachers no longer use this book because it's too expensive. So never mind all that. We don't have that problem here. This is the international edition, which they sell for a reasonable price. It's well worth the cost here. So every Monday, you hand in your notes from the previous week. Got it? And your notes include not only things about phonetics from the textbook, things that I, you know, extra things that I tell you, but in addition, you're going to be reading from the textbook aloud. The camera will focus on you when you do it, and you will make mistakes. How does it feel when you make a mistake? Does it feel wonderful? <laughs> it feels pretty lousy. We humans are pretty afraid of making mistakes, is that right? But you're going to need to have a new view of mistakes as gifts. These are precious gifts. Because when I first started teaching way back in 1990 at Taida, I thought I was OK. You know, I'd studied linguistics and knew some Chinese and so forth. I thought I knew what I was doing. But my students were speaking a version of English that I could usually understand, but it was very different from mine. And I couldn't really understand why it was so different, how it was so different. Until I examined it closely, I listened to many, many students speaking English. Eventually, I did a project with the Guo Ke Hui. And we recorded over 200 people speaking Tai Shi Ying Yu. Yeah, you have your own dialect. This is Ying Yu, it's a very fang yan, it's Tai Shi Ying Yu. And so I'm still working on the project now. I'll write on a, a book on it. I hope to finish it in another year or two. There is a very special kind of English called Tai Shi Yingyu, Taiwan style English. And you think, well, I'm very proud of that. There's Taiwanese English, now Han Guangrong. The thing is, accents are not a problem if they are understandable. If they are not so understandable, it's a problem. Now, I want you to think of a foreigner who speaks kind of weird Chinese. At first, you think it's cute, and you say, ah, you are so nice, you are so nice, you are so but when they, when they start saying, 我是美国人, and they keep on talking like that, your ears get a little tired of it. You don't always understand because there are so many homophones in Chinese. So think of how you feel. You think the person is maybe not so smart. You are less competitive if you have a strong accent. And there's also the matter of power. Now, China is getting more powerful. Everybody's noticed, right? So maybe Chinese-style English will get more and more popular, too. I don't know. It hasn't happened yet. We still have a problem understanding Chinese English and Taiwan English. When your listener gets really tired, I'll give you an example. Do you know anybody who's very old who comes from mainland China? And their Mandarin has a very, very strong accent. 
after they talk to you for 20 minutes. Ah, ni hao, ni hao, hao chup bu jian, ah, what do you, okay, can you understand them? You can understand them, but after 20 minutes talking to this person, how do you feel? You feel very tired, is that right? That's how people feel listening to Taiwan English. We have to try very hard to guess what you mean. And after 20 minutes, we're exhausted. So the next time we see you, do you think we're going to be really excited and want to talk? No, because it tires us out too much. Now, there are many reasons for needing a good accent, and this is really one of them. It's for your listener, to make your listener comfortable, to make things easy for your listener, and then they want to talk with you, it's good for everybody. Now, we should be more tolerant of people with an accent. That is true. But we cannot teach all the listeners in the world. We can, however, try to help the speakers do a better job. That's what we want to do in this class, in addition to learning the theory of phonetics as well. So pronunciation correction is a big thing. <clears throat> what I said about power, it really depends on how powerful and how popular your version is. So for example, if you hear a Frenchman speaking, do you think it is very charming? <laughs> Some people think it's very charming, and that's because French has always been very prestigious in English culture. I shouldn't say always. Since at least many centuries, French has been very, very prestigious in English. We admire the French just because they are so sophisticated and charming. So we don't mind their accent. We think it's cute. But before a people reaches that level of prestige, their accent is simply hard to understand. I had an experience in class once that was kind of funny. I've lived in Taiwan so long. It's over 20 years. And I asked the students what they did over winter vacation. And one student said, TV Gens. Did you all understand? She said, TV Gens. Some of you understand it because you speak Taiwan English. <laughs> I asked at a phonology conference a few years ago. It was full of native speakers of English. Not one person could understand it. Nobody understood it. And we just kept laughing. Finally, they said, well, tell us. What is it? What is it? It was TV games. TV games. A lot of you understood it. TV games. There was a problem with stress. There was no final M. So your listener is not just giving you a hard time. They really don't understand. And when they don't understand, their patience will wear thin. OK, so this is just a little talk about the importance of pronunciation. If you think that it's, there's no point in being very, very picky about pronunciation, you're in the wrong class. You probably will have to try something else. Here is my website. And it's very easy to find. All you have to do is type in Karen Zhong, or Shi Jialin will work just as well. But it's not Shi Jialin, it's not Lin, it's Lin, Eng Eng, you can Wang Zi Pang, Xie Yu Pang, Shuang Mu Lin. All right, these are for all of my classes. This is the one that we need for this class, Introduction to Phonetics 1. And we'll have a look at the index there. We're going to start now with one overview of Introduction to Phonetics, page 1. Most of the information you need to know to get going in this class is on that page. We need a standard version of English for English education. And in Taiwan, they decided in the 1960s it was going to be American English. We will call it GA, General American or SAE, Standard American English. Now, you'll get a lot of people uh, scoffing that and saying that there is no such thing as standard English or standard any language. That's true to a certain extent, but on the other hand, there is a version with certain features that we all pretty much agree on can be called standard in American English. It's mainly based on Midwestern English, starting from, say, Ohio and Indiana and going west. Pretty much most, most of that part of the country speaks what we would call general American or standard English. The biggest differences, differences in pronunciation and dialect come in different parts of the country. All right, we're going to start pre our participation now in the class. Anybody want to guess which parts of the US probably have more variation as regards dialects? Anybody? OK, New Jersey, that's on the East Coast. New Jersey, New York, New England, all of those places have a lot of different dialects. Boston, they're very famous for this, this one sentence that everybody cites, Kapakya Khan Harvard Yad. And I lived in Boston for a semester, and 
my landlady talked just like that. So the dialects are not necessarily spoken by everybody all the time, but there are many different dialects. I have a friend from Boston who's in his 30s, and he has a very strong Boston accent, and sometimes I have to ask him to repeat what he says. <laughs> okay, and usually they can tone it down when they feel that standard English is expected because dialects are not appropriate in every single situation. Sometimes we expect standard English, and so usually people who speak a dialect will also learn the standard variety so they can code switch. To code switch means to choose the right language for the right situation. Our standard will be standard American or general American, but we're also going to talk a lot about standard Southern British. They have an abbreviation SSB, and my British friend calls it RP a lot. I mean, that's used by some people, not by everybody, which stands for received pronunciation. That means it's the pronunciation that we think sounds the most educated and the most appropriate and correct. You should know that most people in Britain now do not speak this language. English is changing. So, for example, you will hear younger people saying one, two, three, four. Is there anything kind of funny about that? Okay, look at those free buildings. Free buildings. Is there anything kind of unusual about that? What's different? One, two, three, four. What's wrong? They don't stick out their tongue, three, one, two, three, four. It's becoming free. Now, my British friend, who is over 50, says, oh, we call that estuary English. I won't write it now. Estuary English is a kind of popular teenager version of English that's, become, that's being adopted by many people. But I listen to the BBC almost every day, and people over 30 and over 40 are talking like this more and more. So British English is changing. It's no longer like what you hear in the most conservative BBC broadcasts or you learn in textbooks. It's changing. Building, the L after vowels is disappearing. It's becoming you, building. All right, we're going to talk about RP or standard British English a lot. That was Peter Latifoget's dialect. Uh, and we're also going to talk about other dialects of English as well. And there are plenty of other ones. There's South African English. There's Australian, Canadian English. We're going to learn about something called Canadian raising. There's Indian English, the English they speak in Singapore, the Philippines, etc. Probably once a week we will have a dictation. And the dictations will seem very, very simple. But I have found that students often have a lot of problem with vowels. For example, ten, ton, tongue, tone. Are you sure about all of those? We have trouble with a lot of those similar vowels. Ton, Tongue, tone, those three often get mixed up, for example. And run, rung, run, rung. Though in that case, it's not the vowels, it's the N and G ending. But they seem like really simple words. But they're simple in a sentence, for example, I have a ton of work to do, and stick out your tongue, and you use the wrong tone. In that case, it's perfectly clear. Ton, tongue, tone. Many people get them wrong. And I've, like I said, I've taught this class for over 10 years. And people still get them wrong, often till towards the end of first semester, they still have problems. So we're going to give you usually 10 items out of context. You will find how much you rely on context to understand things in English, at least some of you. Out of context, it's not so easy. The purpose of all this is not so much a lot of technical information, memorizing rules, or even specifically changing your pronunciation or anything like that. The thing is we want you to sharpen your ears so they're so sensitive that you notice all kinds of things that you never noticed before. Now there's good and bad in this because sometimes you will start criticizing your friends and they'll get really irritated at you. They'll unfriend you on Facebook. They just think you're a real pain. You really need to be careful how you use it. You will also notice it in teachers, I have to warn you. And when it happens on teachers, then you really have to be mature about it, okay? Just put it in your notes. Okay, we all have our mistakes, and you'll notice my weaknesses in other areas, but in pronunciation, that's one where you're going to be able to catch people. But it is good for you, because as a future teacher of English, or as somebody who's interested in linguistics and language, that is something very, very basic. We need to learn how to listen and be sensitive. 
And we're going to go on next to another page that's going to introduce you to the different areas of linguistics and phonetics. So where does linguistics, uh, phonetics fit into in linguistics in general? Okay, we're just going to start. We're going to go around the room. Tell me your name, and then I'm going to ask you to come up here, and then I want you to read a bit. So your first, your name is? Danny? Danny. D-E-A-L-Y. Danny, Danny. Okay, so come on up. I think it's better than bringing out the computers because everybody gets in their own little world if we pull up the computers. Okay, all right, we're going to start here. Everybody follow along and listen. In addition to chapter one of Lathorpe. All right, let's learn his name first of all. I say Latifoget, and most people I know say Latifoget. Hang on just one second. He says Latifoget. He should know, it's his name. <laughs> he says Latifoget. But I've, saying Latif I've said Latifoget so long, I'm not going to change it to Latifoget now. And we used to have a Danish colleague. And I asked him how you say this in Danish because this is a Danish name. Now, watch and listen carefully. He said, Latifol. This is how I remember. I even recorded him saying it. This is how it's pronounced in the original Danish. Listen and watch again. Latifol. Now, you're not expected to say it in Danish, but be aware. As I remember it, if I remember correctly, that's how you say it. We say Latifoged. Okay, Latifoged. Latifoged. Can I go on? Mm -hmm. You can get some help from a site of the University College London. UCL offers an abundance of online phonetic resources. All right, phonetics resources. I'm going to start telling you things about pronunciation as we go along. What happens is it takes a long time, and that's why we go so slow in this class. But each one is important, and it's stuff that's mostly not in the textbook. So I'm going to tell you two things about those two words. Everybody got your notebook ready and your pen? This goes in your notes, and I want to see them on next Monday, because it's important. Number one is the name of the course is phonetics. It's not phonetics, because is the first syllable stressed? Phonetics. No. Many unstressed syllables in English are pronounced with an upside down E, which is called a schwa. It's also called a neutral vowel. In Chinese, it's called a yang yin. So it's pronounced phonetics. Phonetics. Everybody remember that because every single semester, it takes like about half a semester just to fix that. So starting from today, it's no longer phonetics. It's not really wrong. If we can't hear you clearly, you might say, I didn't say, I didn't say frenetics, I said phonetics. We may say it in those situations, but normally we use a neutral vowel, phonetics. Everybody, phonetics. phonetics. And it's not phonetics because that's a quangre phonetics. Now I want you to be quangre about phonetics. I want you to be fanatic about phonetics but I don't want you to call phonetics phonetics. All right, so two things to watch out for. Phonetics. Diarga, busa phonetics, phonetics. Zeba, biao kai nama da. Phonetics, phonetics. All right, that's two things about phonetics, but there were two big things originally. The other thing is about resources. Everybody pay attention and put this down. Unless you're a former student, in which case you know it. What part of speech is phonetics? It's a noun, good. How about resources? It's also a noun. Phonetics here is a noun, but it is functioning as an adjective. Even has social resources. So this is actually a compound. That done used to be a compound. But done used to be it is. It is. All right. So, noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-plus-noun-pl
Right. If I say 很好, can you understand? But do you like it? No. It sounds really awkward and incorrect, is that right? That's exactly how it sounds when you say phonetic resources. You sound very excited, and I don't know why you're so excited and happy. <laughs> well, I know the resources are great, but not that great. It's not that big a deal. We don't say phonetics resources. We say, listen carefully, phonetics resources. Phonetics resources, yeah. Online phonetics resources. Online phonetics resources. All right, this is a big rule. We'll be coming back to it again and again because it is so little known in Taiwan. So when you're reading, mark up your text ahead of time. If you want to do a good job on the camera, pre-read, preview your text before you come to class, and mark all of the compounds so you can get it right the first time. And then you can be very dirty because I will really praise you. I will be so impressed because most people will miss it. Go to this site, oh, sorry, of online phonetics resources. Continue. Online phonetics resources. Good. Many of which we will draw on in this course. Draw on in this course. This is Fen Kai Liang Duan. All right, we're going to talk about phrasing, but not right now because it's a little too much. We will draw on. Uh, Let's just finish the paragraph. Go to this site for a concise introduction to the various fields of linguistics and how phonetics fit into the big picture, mm -hmm. along with lots of useful words. Beautiful. Great job. Okay. Our first reader, that's enough. The bell has rung. We're going to open the link and look at it second hour, so break time. All right. We're going to go look at a page at University College London, UCL for short. And this is a very, very special university because it's sort of like the world center of phonetics, in my opinion. They have a lot of very strong people in phonetics. Some of them are retired, like John Wells, now retired. Um, but they are just very, very strong in phonetics. And they have incredibly good online resources for, for phonetics. We're going to use one of them right now. But that's not the only one. There are many others. So if you enjoy this kind of stuff, you can just explore the sites of the faculty who teach phonetics at UCL. All right, we're going to go to this page just for some background, a little overview. And we'll go over them fairly quickly because they don't relate directly to what we're doing. They just kind of give us a context. All right, you can see pretty clearly. The first one is what? In Chinese? Fa, and that sounds fancier than Wen Fa, right? And in mainland China, they tend to say Yu Fa. So we have three different terms, which all mean grammar. But for school grammar in China, they usually say Yu Fa. In Taiwan, they say Wen Fa. But when we study it as a branch of linguistics, we call it syntax. So the example is, he gave the book to Mary is fine, but gave he book to Mary too does not work. We will not be able to process that very easily, unless you're Yoda. In Star Wars, I haven't watched Star Wars, but I hear about Yoda all the time because, for example, I am back the going to. That's the way he talks. He, he mixes up his words. He has his own grammar. But normally, that doesn't work in standard English. So syntax is about putting words in the right order with the right endings and so forth and so on so that they form a sentence. Semantics in Chinese is? Yi, that's right. That's where we study the meanings of words. And their example here is uh, the meaning of sentences. In the sentence, he gave the book to Mary, what was happening, who was doing the giving, who was doing the receiving. That's just a very small example. We look deeply into the meanings of words and semantics. This seems to be a somewhat less developed area of linguistics. Syntax, syntax is more greatly developed. A lot of people in linguistics do syntax partly due, or maybe to a great part, are due to uh, Noam Chomsky and his generative grammar and all his various incarnations of that. So syntax is quite big in linguistics. Semantics, not quite as many people do it. There are many people doing it, but not quite as many. And it's not quite as developed, I would say, in the bigger scheme of things. Pragmatics is xue. Now, if I give you something that you need and you appreciate, you will answer by saying, Normally, you will say thank you. Is thank you always appropriate? 
No. Do you know a situation where it wouldn't be so appropriate? Have any of you been to mainland China? All right. Do they say xie xie all the time like we do in Taiwan? No. And the xie xie they will think you're really strange sometimes. <laughs> because until recently, they did not say xie xie very much. And not just because they're rude. Although, honestly, to our ears, having been in Taiwan for many years, they will sound rude to us in many situations. When they, sound, when they talk to each other as friends, they often sound like they're zai jia. But if they say, they think that you're really niang niang chang. <laughs> they have a whole different standard of interaction. Now, it's not that one is good and one is bad. It's what people are used to. We have a social contract. Everybody agrees on pretty much on some standard forms of behavior. And xie xie is not standard at all in the languages of the world. I was told that in Nepal as well, and probably many other countries, saying thank you can be insulting. You don't say thank you to somebody. Of course I will do this because I love you, I'm your family member, I'm your friend, or whatever. So saying thank you is not always correct, although it's definitely expected here in Taiwan. We're really big on xie xie and bu hao yi si, right? We're really big on that. Those belong to pragmatics. It's the kind of language that's appropriate for each different situation. And bu hao yi si works for just about anything in Taiwan, doesn't it? Just about anything. Somebody's giving you a letter, right? Like a quite song, like, oh, <laughs> so that works for Taiwan, but you're not going to find that elsewhere. There are many other examples as well. Like, what do you say when you bump into somebody? Those things belong to pragmatics. Morphology has two common translations into Chinese, which are. I think that's the best translation because it's the clearest. The other translation is xing tai xue, because morph means a form. It's a study of the forms of words. So for example, they give you, uh, they say here, um, like, likes, liked, likeness, likely, likelihood. We find different patterns here. That's all part of morphology. Part of that, however, does belong to syntax. Like, likes, liked, that's more part of syntax. That's where morphology and syntax overlap. That belongs to both. Morphology, we're very interested in how words are put together. For example, um, for example, preheat. Pre means before, and heat means to make something hot, right? So we have the word to heat. Please heat up your food in the microwave. You can preheat it before you do something else, to preheat something. Or Please preheat it before you use the, um, the iron or whatever it is. So putting words together, for example, a prefix and a stem, that's morphology. Phonology, that sounds a lot like phonetics. Does anybody know the Chinese for phonology and the difference between phonology and phonetics? We're going to be talking about phonology in this course because you have to have both together. You have to have phonology in order to do phonetics and vice versa. What is phonology in Chinese? Sheng yun xue, also called yin yun xue. It's all the same. It's a study of not just the pronunciation. We talk about pronunciation and phonetics, but also what basic sounds are used by a language. For example, what is the set of phonemes? That means the set of sounds that we use in a language. That's really phonology. And how do they come together? For example, we can put S and T together. We can say say and we can say stay. And we can add an R, stray. But can we say stpay? No, that doesn't work. That's one part of phonology called phonotactics. So studying the patterns and the rules, the structures of sound and language, in language, is phonology. Then we have phonetics, which is what we're doing, that is in Chinese, yu yin xue. The main thing we're studying is the physical phenomenon of sound. We're also studying patterns. We're also studying phonology. But we're more interested in the details than the people in phonology. The people in phonology are more interested in system and structure. We are interested in those things too, but we're also really interested in the details. We're interested in a lot of details. So maybe if I say put, 
and I say put. Are those two different words? Put it down and put it down. Are those two different words? No? They're the same word? Did they sound exactly the same? No. Did it make a difference though? Not really, but some people maybe use a lot of air and some people don't. Now that may be one detail that we are interested in in phonetics. We look at all the details. Often the so-called details, in fact, affect the structure. So it's not that easy to pull those two apart. But in general, in phonetics, we are interested in a physical phenomenon and we're interested in a lot of details. After that is psycholinguistics. In Chinese, that is and that is the study of how the human brain processes language. So for example, if I give you a word as a sort of suggestion, I just flash the word food on the screen, and then the next word is beacon. What do you think a lot of people will think that word is? Beacon, B-E-A-C-O-N. Well, a lot of people might think it's bacon, pagan, right? Because you're already thinking of food. Now, I pulled that example out, not really out of the air. It actually happened in, in a test. A lot of people translated beacon as bacon. That's because probably at the beginning of that paragraph, they said that Americans are all fat and no meat. Did anybody take that test? OK, because I know this is a test recently given. Some, in, some of you maybe have taken it. So Americans are all fat and no meat. They think they are the beacon of the world. <laughs> Everybody said Americans thought they were the pagan of the world. Everybody. Now, one problem is they probably didn't know the word beacon, which means a bright, shining light that guides ships. A guiding light, that's a beacon, B-E-A-C-O-N. But because they were already thinking of meat and fat, they probably were pushed towards the, the idea of bacon. Now, that's something for a psycholinguist to look into. That's called priming. We've had a suggestion that what we're saying has maybe something to do with food. And so that's probably why their brain called up bacon so quickly. Besides, it was more familiar. That's psycholinguistics. Then social linguistics in Chinese? You guys know that better, all right? Um, or at least you're more forthcoming. This is a study of how language variation is related to its use in society to form groups of geographical region, economic class, or ethnicity, or So everybody has different ways of talking, and most of us have many different ways of talking. Those are topics that social linguists are interested in. And computational linguistics is the study of how computers can be used to analyze and generate sentences. It's actually a big field, and basically everybody has to do computational linguistics now. Uh, one common use of it is corpus linguistics. We collect lots and lots of language data, and then we see how people really talk. We see if there are patterns in the data. That's just a very, um, a very, a very, uh, easy way to put it. And the application of linguistic theory to language teaching. That is applied linguistics, basically. And applied linguistics is? OK, and that about covers it. So that's where phonetics fits in. There are, these are not all of the subfields, but these are probably the biggest ones, the ones that are best known. And let's look now at the next paragraph. What is phonetics? Let's have another reader. Would you like to read for us? Start from the title. I'm really big on titles, by the way. Please note that down. You need to read all the section titles and headings and things in this class. Go ahead. What is phonetics? Phonetics is the study of speech. It's concerned with how speech sounds can be categorized, how they are generated in the, generated. Generated in the human vocal all right, I'm going to have to correct a couple of things because they're so common. Note them down now and remember them because we're going to read them again and again in the textbook. Now, how speech sounds. is one possible interpretation, but it's not. It's how speech sounds. In this case, it is a compound. So we don't say speech sounds. We say speech sounds. That's the first thing. 
And the second one is <clears throat> generated. A lot of people may put the stress on the second syllable. In American English, it's generated. And third, vocal tract, yes, it's a compound. Vocal, it's a but there are some, some expressions like this that are stressed like a compound, and vocal tract is one of them. So, uh, speech sounds generated vocal tract. Okay, go. Listener. We go up mm -hmm. when we're not done speaking. Okay, that's called a continuation rise. Let's go on. And how the listener is able to recognize them. Watch the G, everybody. I put the G in, some people maybe don't. Recognize. Recognize. Uh huh. Okay, and watch the M and them. A lot of Taiwanese will say then. So, them. Go on. The study of the organization of speech sounds in a language details phonology. Okay, called. Cold. Not cold. Not cold. Called. Ah, ah. Called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the study of how humans use their vocal apparatus. Okay, this is another word we'll see a lot. It's a Latin word. Vocal apparatus. Good vocal tract. Young. Home in Everyone, vocal apparatus. Vocal apparatus. Good. Okay. It's called articulatory phonetics. All right, that sounds more British. Articulatory. Some people say it that way. In American, it's articulatory. Articulatory. Let's try that. Articulatory. Articulatory. Articulatory phonetics. We call that fa-yin yin shue. It's the study of how we produce sounds. Okay? The study of the quality of the sound used to signal different pronunciations. It's called acoustic phonetics. Acoustic phonetics. And that's sheng shue yin shue. That's the physics of sound. Also, watch your th, the, the. Mm-hmm. Well, the study of how we perceive and decode speech sounds is sometimes called auditory phonetics. Auditory phonetics, that means ting jue. Ting jue yin It's a study of how we hear language, okay? Finally, the general field of study in which instruments are used to study speech pronunciation mm -hmm. and perception. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait. Study what? And it's a, it's a compound, watch out. Speech production. Speech production. Speech production. You must hear that. Speech production. We don't say speech. <coughs> excuse me. Speech production. It's speech production. Speech production. Okay. And perception is called experimental phonetics. Experimental phonetics. Phonetics. Jiang guo le, so we make a jump. Experimental phonetics. Pretty good. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay? Yong Chi Ka We're not going to clap every time somebody reads, but we're just getting going, and the first ones are especially brave. All right, so now you should, ha should have an idea of the kinds of things that we're going to study in phonetics. These are different sub branches of phonetics. Our, well, phonology, we already talked about the difference between phonetics and phonology. Phonology is not a branch of phonetics, they're, I would say that they're equal. Articulatory phonetics. How do we produce the sounds? For example, what do we do to pronounce an M sound? Mm. What do we do? We put our lips together. So we're going to learn a lot of words that describe what we do to produce sounds like M. Mm. So articulatory phonetics, acoustic phonetics is the study of sound, it's the physics of sound, auditory phonetics, and that's how we hear sound, we hear the sounds of language with our ears. And experimental phonetics, anytime you're using any kind of equipment, uh, any kind of instruments to study language, that's experimental phonetics. Okay, we are done with this page. <clears throat> There's another page about what people in linguistics do, and you can read that on your own if you like. It's optional. So that's this link. We're not going to go to that. But I will show you this page. It's on my website. It's language and linguistics links. If you're looking for all kinds of language resources, that's, that's on my website. If you go to the 
the home page, you will see it here where it says language and linguistics, that goes to that page. Extras, so those are good things to know about as well. Let's go back to our page. We're here and we're going to go now to page two. Um, we'll get through this really quickly. Some people say that they actually really like this class because it's so concrete. A lot of classes in the Y when she do they have Belgian Dan? No. Does that sometimes make it very difficult for you to know what did I learn from this class? Do you sometimes have that feeling? You don't know exactly what it was you learned from the class because a lot of the things that you get from the class are very intangible. They've made you more sensitive, more aware. You're thinking about all kinds of questions of morals or of how people interact, all kinds of things. But you can't really quantify it very easily. In this class, you can. <laughs> things are very, very duty. And we have a lot of bells and dying. It doesn't mean that we're positive that everything is right. It's full of mistakes like any other field. But we really go more for concrete things in this class. So it's easier to test you on a lot of the things that we cover in this class. It's much more concrete. Um, both are important. So this can maybe balance off some of that feeling of Xu Wu Piao Mao, or Piao Miao, or whatever it is. <laughs> um, so, um, all right. The areas of physics we've already mentioned is acoustics. So we'll study that mainly second semester. It's, we'll have all kinds of demonstrations with toys. We bring toys to class. We bring musical instruments to class. And we have all kinds of fun software. So second semester is really cool. It's just really fun because you get to play. And I think that learning is best done through playing. Learning should be fun. We're born to love learning. You look at children. They want to figure everything out. At some point, we start not liking school sometimes because they're forcing things on us too fast and they're not very interesting. But left to explore, every single human being loves to learn. And fun teaches us a lot of things. So second semester, we're going to do a lot of that. We're going to have some fun things to play with. OK. And you'll get a lot of science stuff. You'll actually do some math second semester that everybody can handle. Some people got so confident and so happy that they could do math. They thought that they were lousy at math. But after we did logarithms, she said, this is no problem at all. I can handle this. She went on to do advanced calculus. And she now has a PhD in, 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 uh, uh, in language therapy. Okay, So if you learn it at the right pace, step by step, I think anybody can learn anything. And then you will gain a lot of confidence from this class if you go through this. Okay, and as I mentioned, what we really want to do is develop a keener sensitivity to sounds and to language in general. So you're going to start noticing things around you. Start taking notes. Whenever I'm listening to the radio, whenever I hear somebody say something interesting, I've just got a piece of paper with my to-do list and I scribble down notes and I go home and I go to now. And you end up with a lot of material that you probably would forget otherwise. So start taking notes about stuff around you, interesting things in language. For example, um, what characterizes baby talk in Taiwan? How do you speak to children? What kinds of things do you do with language? Hmm? <laughs> right? For example, xiao ta ta. Right? So you have reduplication. Is that the only thing you do? Sorry? You speak slowly. You speak with a higher pitched voice usually to little children. People do that in most languages. And what's another thing you do with tones in, Ch in Taiwan? Tones. All right, how do you say elder brother in Chinese? Gege in theory, right? Beijing has a gege. Does anybody say gege? No, nobody says gege. Do some people say gege? Is that okay? Yeah, that's OK. All right, but what do you usually call him? Good. Right. <laughs> now, does the first tone normally turn into a third tone? Not normally. We don't say ta ta. Shout ta ta. <laughs> we tend to do this with a lot of relatives, names of family members and relatives, right? 
You can do it with the other ones. How about little sister? And that has another meaning now, doesn't it? Mega may may. Yeah, okay. And how about father? Baba, baba. <laughs> you usually say? Baba. All right, this is just an example. Now, you take it for granted because you're a native speaker, but if you think about it, you think none of those are third tone words. That's just an example of the kind of thing you can start noticing. That has to do with phonetics. Tones are very much uh, in the domain of phonetics. So, you gain a keener sensitivity, you start noticing things all the time, and you find it really interesting. You think, why do we do that? Does everybody do that? I wonder, you know, if other people in the South do that, or if I wonder if older people do that, or younger people do that, or people from mainland China do that, etc. So start noticing not just what people say, but how they say it. And, like I said, you're going to start noticing a lot of pronunciation flaws in the people around you. But just view it as language variation, and write it down, put it in your notes, you can learn from everything. So I won't know who Linda is. Linda Wong helps a little bit. And then your name in Chinese. For me, Shi Jialin. Then read your student number. So if somehow things get mixed up, I can find out whose it is by the student number. And also say where you grew up. For example, Taipei, Zhanghua, wherever you're from. What your native language is. The language you are best at, that you learned early, is your native language. Some of you maybe learned Minayu first, but you're much better at Mandarin. In that case, I would say, Mandarin is your native language. However you want to do it, though, is up to you. So, say what your native language is. If you learn Minayu at home, or Kejiahua, or anything else, mention that, too. Then, play back what you recorded. Make sure that it's getting recorded and make sure it sounds okay. Don't blow into the microphone too much, or you will have a lot of p -p popping sounds, which are not good for recording. And if you have a lot of smacking sounds, there's a really good thing that helps, that's lemon water. Put it in water and that will usually clear up the um, spit in your mouth and you won't sound so bad or the phlegm in your throat. Okay, so make sure that everything is working okay. Watch out for background noise. If you live in, the, in a dorm, you may have a noisy roommate. So do it when they're away. Do it when they're gone. Okay? And if there's a lot of noise outside, you may need to close the window, don't have the radio on, etc. Try to keep the background noise down as much as possible. Don't read too loud or don't read too soft. <laughs> and like I said, watch out for smacking and too much aspiration. I'll be up in my. All right, so first of all, after you've made sure everything is working fine and you've got all the information there, then there's a text down here in Chinese. I want you to read it in Mandarin. Just read it normally. It's not a race. And you are not Li and Cho, all right? You're not a broadcaster. Just read it normally. <laughs> Just read it comfortably and normally. Um, oh, I don't, please, I don't want that. <laughs> all right? And don't read too fast, like I said. All right, that's the Chinese, and I'll show you the text so you know what's coming up. This is the text that I'm using in my research project of Taiwan English. I had other texts in the past, but now I know this one pretty much by memory. I've heard it probably a few thousand times. Um, this way I can compare you to other people. So I can find the traits very quickly of Taiwan English in your, in your speech uh, that I've already observed in other people. So here is the text. And why is it this text? Well, one reason is I happen to like parrots. Parrots can learn how to talk, and they're very smart. If you know about Alex, and if you don't know about Alex, look him up. I have a fondness for parrots, and this is a very touching story of a parrot. So you read it in Mandarin, and second step is you read it in English. Because you will have already read it in Chinese, you already know the content. So when you read the English, it will be much easier because you already know what happens in the story. And it's all about Mr. and Mrs. Huang. So just read it as it's written in English. Okay, here's the whole story. It looks kind of long, but it's not that long. It doesn't take that long. All right, after you've finished Mandarin and English, if you also speak another dialect of Chinese, like Minayu, many of you speak Minayu, 
This is optional, you don't have to do it. But it's really interesting and fun if you do do it because you get information about how good you are at Minayu. A lot of you assume that you're okay with it because when you go home you can speak to your grandparents in Minayu or whatever. But for some of you, do some of your grandparents criticize your Minayu sometimes? Right? So the younger generation is learning a different variety of Minayu and sometimes they don't learn it as well because especially here in northern Taiwan, so many people usually speak Mandarin most of the time, right? You speak a lot of Mandarin here in northern Taiwan, depending on where you work or where you go to school. If you live in a suburb in a working class area and then you work at a construction company, probably everybody speaks Minayu. Okay, so it depends on where you are, but for people who have ended up at Taida, you're probably more used to Mandarin. Anyway, you will find out if you try the Minayu, what your level of Minayu is. And some people give up in frustration. They say, I wish I would down them a lot. Okay, um, but that's okay. It's up to you. You don't have to do it. If you're not comfortable doing it, you don't have to. And don't read it word for word because you don't learn those words anyway when you learn to speak Minayu. Just tell it like a story. If you know Hakka, Kejiahua, If you know those, then you can try those as well. If you don't, then just forget it. All right, another optional part of this assignment is if you have studied a second foreign language, say German, French, Japanese, etc., Russian, Latin, whatever, <laughs> if you can do it in Latin, that will be totally amazing. Um, there are some readings in some of those languages below. I have a couple of jokes in German, French, and Spanish. There's a small reading in Japanese from my Japanese textbook from many years ago. You can read those if you like. And if you speak a language that's not on there, pick a very short passage, just one little paragraph. Tell me what language it is, how you learned it, and then read it. Okay? In addition to the text, I put a few other resources here. For example, there's a Mandarin online dictionary. <laughs> Maybe some people will want to check. Here's an English dictionary. And this is a really, really good dictionary if you need to know the pronunciation of something. Don't rely on dictionaries published in Taiwan with KK Imbiao. If you need to know the pronunciation, go to Merriam Webster, listen to the audio files, and imitate. That's how you should learn pronunciation from now on. Because the KK Imbiao, first of all, the dictionaries produced in Taiwan are often not accurate. They often have a lot of mistakes. And another thing is the KK probably it, it's it, not probably it's not going to give you all the information you need. So get in the habit of listening in order to learn good pronunciation. This is American English for British English. There's another very nice online dictionary called How to Say, and you can check British pronunciation if you happen to be learning British English. But don't just start now for this assignment, okay? There's even a Taiwanese dictionary, Hakka dictionary, Cantonese dictionary, French and Spanish, and German, Japanese. Okay, that's it. That's the whole assignment. The whole thing, I think, will maybe take you about, the, the recording itself will maybe be about, say, 15 to 20 minutes long. And you will need to save it as an MP3 file. There's special software for MP3 uh, file conversion. There's details on the site. And when you're done, listen to it yourself. All right, there's one more part of the assignment I didn't tell you about. You have to write your gansham. When you're done recording everything, play it back. Listen to it carefully. Concentrate while you're listening. Take notes. Write it up into a short essay in which you express your feelings about what you just heard. You say, you know, I think I sound really good in Mandarin. I sound great in my native language. I should be a broadcaster. I think I'm going to change departments. Okay? <laughs> Maybe you will dis discover you sound really pretty good in your native language. Your English is not bad, but you hesitated or you have problems with certain sounds, etc. Okay? So whatever it is you think about your recording, different aspects of it, Write it down, just about one side of one A4 page, double-spaced or single-spaced, no, don't, not single-spaced. Whatever you do, whatever you're comfortable with, I don't really care about that. 
just so it's about one A4 page. If you don't have much to say, you can double space. You know, if you have more to say, make it single space. This is the, the page that we're going to start with on Wednesday. So you may want to have a look at it ahead of time. This is the vocal tract and the points of articulation. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time of another assignment that you need to do. So you can start early on that one too if you like. And that is you're going to become familiar with the mid-sagittal view of the head. The head cut in half. It sounds gory, but it doesn't look gory, so it shouldn't bother you. There's another one that's a little gorier. Uh, this one is all black and white, doesn't matter. You're going to have to draw this. There's a model in your textbook, which I will tell you about next time. But if you want to get an early start on it, you need to learn how to draw this figure freehand. Because for some assignments, we have to draw heads and show where the tongue goes and what the lips are doing, etc., and what the vocal cords are doing. So if you want to sort of pow or get ahead, have a look at this page. You'll find it on the next page uh, on the site. And start practicing drawing this figure. So not just science, we're doing some art here as well. And for me personally, I practice on an iPad. If you have an iPad, that's a nice way to draw because it's really easy to erase. So you can do that. And you're going to have to hand it in, though. The iPad is just for practice. When you hand it in, you're going to have to uh, print it out, and, and, or not print it out, but actually hand in a, a paper with your handwritten drawings or hand-drawn drawings on it. Okay? But you can practice on an iPad. I found that really fun, and that, that kind of helped me get it a little more like it looks like in the drawing. Okay? And since we have just a teeny tiny bit of time, I don't like wasting any time. We have so little time, it's so precious. Why don't we start looking at some of the articulatory organs in our vocal tract, okay? This whole area of the head, you all know what we're looking at, right? As if we are standing sideways and somebody cut your head open. Yep, yeah. We wouldn't do that on, on you, don't worry. Um, this is what you will see. Of, this doesn't show all the details, but it shows the important organs that we need to know about for this part of the class. The whole area that we use for talking is called the vocal tract. In Chinese, usually translated as sheng dao. Sheng dao, fa sheng yin de nei tiao lu. Okay? And the bell is going to ring any second, but we'll just start with some easy ones. We know that these are the lips. Aha. Uh -huh. Upper lip, lower lip, that's all we could fit in. That's the bell. That's all for today. And we're in a different room on Wednesday. Make sure you go to the right place. It's in Xinjiang Dalo. And thank you all. If you have questions, come see me now.